We're, we're excited about the fact that we're wrapping up our final preparations to get underway here at about one o'clock this afternoon uh, and have the opportunity to deliver uh, a pretty unique medical capability that no Navy in the world has the capability to do. And that's where uh, a guy like uh, Captain Buckley behind me brings that medical capability and I, any of the questions with specific medical capabilities I'll let uh, Captain Buckley uh, answer those. My function will be to go down and uh, help with the command and control coordination between the maritime component commander and the land component commander there. Basically, think of my, uh, my role and the role of uh, my staff is to keep everybody out of the way so that the medical professionals can do their jobs. And so I'm pretty good at that and they're really good at what they do. Uh, and then, you know, subject to your questions, I, I, I would just turn it over to Captain Buck, Buckley to talk about capability. Captain, uh, seeing the ocean conditions and weather conditions between here and Puerto Rico, how long do you think it will take you? What do you expect? Because we're going to have to wait. So uh, the conditions are pretty good right now. The seas laid, started laying down yesterday. Uh, we think that the transit will take, we, we should be on station by 3 October. Uh, we, if we have to slow down a little bit, for October at the latest, but I'm pretty confident we'll be there by the third. So we don't know where we're going yet. The uh, you know those final mission analysis and coordination with the national level uh, agencies is ongoing. We'll get our orders in route, and uh, and you know wherever we go, that what the great part about what comfort brings to the fight is the ability to move anywhere that they they ask us to go. So, so uh, again, it, that, that's part of the mission analysis that's still going on. As you can imagine, with the level of destruction that occurs from a Cat 5 hurricane or Cat 4 or whatever it was when it made shore, um, we're very cautious about how we bring a large ship in. And so those surveys are still ongoing. Uh, we're working with our Coast Guard counterparts that are down in the area to get that assessment. And so... Um, we, we are flexible. The, the medical capability that the ship can deliver can be done underway, it can be done in port, or it can be done at anchor. And so uh, between the helicopter capability that we have, the boats that we have, all of those things together give us the ability to be flexible in our mission and still contribute uh, with very little, with very little uh, interruptions in that process. So, so I mean, the part about about that for us is, you know, if we go pure side, then there's that challenge of things are going to have to move by truck. Uh, the the assessments that are coming out of there, you know, are mostly what I hear on the news as well. And that is, you know, there's some areas that we're starting to do it. There, there are uh, issues with or or challenges with fuel distribution and things like that. Um, you know, we're flexible enough to do that. And, and what we, we, one of the capabilities that we have is, should we have to go out and restock or something like that, we could leave port for a very short period of time, go out there and meet, uh, meet underway replenishment with our other combat logistics force ships and be able to do those resupplies. So again, that goes to the flexibility and the uniqueness of, of comfort going into an area like that. So uh, I know that my orders are a minimum of 30 days. Um, you know, and, and again, that, that, those are decisions that are made much above our level. Uh, what we'll do is we'll go out there and hit the ground running or hit the deck plates running, as we say in the Navy, and, uh, and we'll keep moving until somebody tells us that we're no longer needed. It's 30 days pretty similar to previous So, so I, I I don't know enough about that, to be honest with you. Uh, I think with, when you look at the U.S. response that's going in, uh, now that things are starting to get mobilized and we're able to make the assessments that we make, uh, I, 
you know, my initial cut is 30 days seems to be about right for this mission. What was the last time Comfort deployed? So, continuing promise 2015. So two years ago. They went to, I think, 13 countries approximately and saw 122,000 people. Any reason why now it's being deployed to Puerto Rico, um, that's in the Texas or Florida? So any of the specifics with this, why you guys are getting out? So, you know, those are decisions that are national level decisions. Uh, you know, it, decisions made well above my pay grade. Uh, I can I can only say that we've received the order to go and it's it's time to go. Uh, what decisions were made at the national level, I'm not privy to that. And I wouldn't feel comfortable trying to answer, you know, what, why decision makers made those decisions. Captain, how do you feel about the fact that there was a petition drive that was literally sent to Comfort that started several days ago? Uh, you know, what do you think you would say about that? You, you know, again, I, I'm, a, I'm a simple sailor from Chicago. You know, my, my job is to, when somebody tells me to go, I go. Um, all of the rest of it, is, is frankly irrelevant to me. We have a mission to go deliver a capability and get involved in an operation to reduce human suffering in an area that has been devastated by weather over the last five to six weeks. That's all I'm focused on and that's all that my medical professionals that I'm going with are, are focused on. What is it like uh, gearing up to get ready once you get the work to go? Like just, just getting a ship like this ready to so that you know, that's a great question. So, to understand that, you have to understand uh, how how the ship is designed in in a non-operational status, right? So, this ship is normally maintained in what we call a reserve operating status five, which means they can get the order and be ready to go in five days. Now, that's from the civilian mariner standpoint, and then the uniqueness about comfort is that we can tailor those medical packages that Captain Buckley can talk about a little bit more in depth here. Um, and typically that's a five day or plus process depending on the size of that package. You know, we started posturing as we saw weather coming in. Uh, we were leaning forward in the event that we were asked to go, especially as Irma was, was approaching the United States. And so uh, we made some of those preparations uh, decisions that were made within the Navy to do that. Here's what's really unique. 48 hours ago, there were less than 100 people on board this ship. That's, that's civilian mariners and, and medical treatment facility personnel at the same time. Over the last 36 hours, we have flown medical professionals in for that tailored medical package along with their support personnel from all over the country, and the number of people that are on board right now are over 800. Think of the logistics that's required and the capability that's required to move over 700 young men and women and, and you know good Americans to come on board and drop what they're doing to go and deliver that capability. Uh, I couldn't be more proud of how Military Sealift Command, how the medical community have responded and to walk aboard the ship or talk to those sailors who were all ready to go, uh, you know, that's what keeps you coming back to work every day. You all probably want to talk to the other guy, so I can get out of the way unless there's any more specific questions for me. For the cameras, can you state your first and last name again in your, your Yes, my name is uh, Captain Kevin Robinson. I'm the Commodore of Military Sealift Command Atlantic and the Task Force Commander. And on board here, I am the forward command element for comfort to fall in on the other military uh, commanders that are in the area. Okay. Yeah, sorry. You got him? You good? You taking my wallet? <laughs> yeah. Get a pick yeah. Yeah.
morning. I'm Captain Kevin Buckley. I'm an emergency medicine physician with a subspecialty in pediatric emergency medicine. I am the commanding officer of the hospital, or they call the MTF, Military Treatment Facility, on the Comfort. Um, Captain did a good job of giving you some of the overview, overviews. I can give you a general spiel of what we can do, or you can ask me questions. What would you prefer? Well, I can't speak to what's available currently in Puerto Rico, but I can tell you what we can do. And that's okay. So we have the capabilities uh, of any hospital that you have in this country. So we have full bunch of specialists. I have a full, I have a CAT scanner, angio suite, and I have dialysis capabilities. The only thing we don't have on board is an MRI, because if you know MRIs, they don't do very well with metal, and you can see there's a lot of metal there uh, that would probably interfere with that. So we don't have an MRI, but we do have a, a, a new, new capable CT scanner, ultrasound. We can run up to 11 ORs, but we're only going to be loaded for six. The ship is built, the primary mission is for combat, combat support. So the combat support mission is a little different package than humanitarian. In combat, we don't bring OBGYN doctors and pediatricians and neonatologists. In this tailored package, we, we have more community health, more primary care. I have a 50-bed ER capability on board the ship. Uh, I have the ability to store about 250 people and we'll have up to 50 ICU beds. If you, the, the potential of the hospital ship actually, if it's paid for combat, would probably be one of the largest trauma centers in the United States. If you Google it, it would be number seven because uh, it, it has up to a thousand bed capability. We're not packed on a thousand bed because again, our mission is not trauma for combat. It's more for humanitarian assistance. Well, we have the capability to, to the MSC command who runs the whole part of the ship has been a great partnership with them and logistically we can we can run for six months for combat without being resupplied for medical supplies. Food, we would need that for humanitarian because of the nature of the short notice and the flexibility, we don't know what we're gonna face yet. We load for about 30 days of supplies. Uh, I actually have, I have Navy sailors uh, from Puerto Rico, including my, my admin chief, chief who was supposed to go on vacation next week to see his family in Puerto Rico, and they're fine, by the way. They're in the east, uh, western part of the, uh, sorry, eastern part of the island, but they're okay. It took them a week to get a hold of them, but they're, they're okay. There are also a number of sailors that have come on my crew, so it's like a nest egg. So I usually have about 58 sailors that sit here and maintain the shop. It's not in mothballs. If you know anything about equipment, you have to keep things running. All my lab equipment capabilities, CT scanners, radiology machines, required to be used or at least turned on and you can't let them leave, leave them off for a month and come back and expect them to work. You guys all know technology, it's a bit fickle. Uh, so I have that crew. Then I have a critical core that comes on board, which is sourced from different 18 MTFs around the country. Majority comes from Portsmouth, which is local. That's 241 more people. That doesn't bring you a capability for medical support, but it's like a framework or a bone structure for the hospital to get ready to take patients. And then the Foss Taylor package, which we brought on board, over 529 people were tasked with the mission less than 36 hours ago, some as late as last night, and they're here this morning uh, to help support us. So what the, as a doc, coming on board the ship and seeing, seeing the capability, it's really an impactful and emotional what, what we can deliver. Uh, and thanks to the partnership with MSC Command in the hull and Navy Medicine East and Navy Medicine in general view med leading forward, I don't think you guys understand. No civilian agency can bring this capability in 24 hours to be able to go on a ship to go anywhere in the world, anytime, anywhere. And because of our capabilities, any deep port, we have two uh, transports that you may see on a, on, a, on, a, on a regular cruise line that can bring patients up as well, up to 40 patients at a time. Most cruise lines just bring things down, but to bring the load up to, be, to do that is, is a great capability as well. So we can bring them from the, from the pier side, from small boats, if we can't get up further up in, into, a, into an area, or by the large deck can actually move in, move in closer. Uh, pier side does have some limitations, uh, but we can we can be flexible and do almost anything. So when we're fully full to bore, we can process about 200 people per day, it, depending on our supply list. For combat, would be six months indefinitely for that period of time. Uh, we don't know what we're going to be tasked with. We don't know what the medical ask is. That's from higher up national authorities or work with FEMA to decide where the base use of us, because we don't have the, uh, the I don't, I'm just a captain, I'm on this level, my job is to be ready to go with our team, 
and get what we can to be as much as flexible or, or Semper Gumby as you want to be uh, to be on the site. But those areas will have to be determined where our best impact will be. There is a great already a, a Navy asset and military medicine asset on on land. So we're going to plus up with them and the, the captain, the Commodore, will actually give us, oh, he's over there now, will give us uh, uh, the guidance where we're, we're going to go. So wherever he says we're going, my team is ready to support and, uh, and provide care. Do you have a sense of um, like what types of aid might be in demand? Like, for instance, like in an earthquake, you may say the components of a certain type of injury. In hurricanes, is there generally perhaps something that you're expecting to see more of? Or you can well, we, we use a model-based, computer model base that actually can tell you what kind of economy you're dealing with, emergency economy, uh, a well-developed nation type thing, and timelines, so depending on when you get and what kind of disaster. So whether it is a, a local, local disaster, uh, you, you know, a, a earthquake knocks the building down, or you may have a wider spread, so that you can then put in these, these questions or input into the data and get an input. Normally, the first few days of an of, of incident like this would be more trauma-related incident, things falling down, things being blown over or hit by debris uh, that are hitting. As we further move out, there's more medical things. So as you lose some of the civilization type things, running water, proper sanitation, things like dysentery or cholera uh, can also be on. So usually around day 14 through on, you'll start getting more medical issue or medical patients who haven't seen their doctor or haven't got their medications refilled may have problems uh, that may be due to their original disease. So again, trauma up front, and then as you go further out, it's more medical based. I'm sorry, she had a question next. Nearly. Okay, so if somebody needed surgery, yes. like, are there things that you can't do? And then in that case, what happens then? Well, there are certain surgeries we just wouldn't want to do. We wouldn't want to do a joint replacement because that's a long follow on. Someone has a broken bone or needs a washout, yes. So, one of the differences between this ship and some of the other medical capabilities, the LADH, they can do damage control surgery and major surgeries to stop them, but they don't have the follow on holding capability. So, if we have a patient that has a contaminated wound and may have to go back to the OR five or six times over a week, we can keep the person on board and do that and do all of that definitive surgery. What about the pharmacy? There's a whole pharmacy too, right? We have a pharmacy based on, we have what we call AMOLs, which are packages that are pre-based packages based on what we think. We don't keep anything on the ship for the most part until we get an order to where to go because we want to tailor our mission what we need. And we get support from MSC, from our, our civilian contractors, from Portsmouth, and we've actually called commands up and down the eastern coast if we have, you don't know, have something we can get to pull. And all that's been loaded on. I mean, 98 pallets of food by my guys during a storm, winds, the winds of the last couple of days here because the, the hurricane have been in there and made it very challenging. So it's been a heroic effort, a teamwork effort to provide a capability like as the commoner said, very few in the world can do. Do you pick those medicines up? We have them on board now. So we've, so we've loaded them over the last two days. That's why we have the Ross 5 status. It takes, you have to get your mission and then task what you need. And it takes, a, it does take a few hours to do that. Can you give us a sense of how much medication, how many supplies? I have enough for 30 days. Enough for 30 days. And can it be Well, so one of the things, as we get more information from higher authorities, as I said, we don't know what the full ask is. We have to be very broad. If we get, we need to do more, say, dialysis or more so-and-so, we have the ability to say order up from the ship and order ahead and have re-delivery so we can do the underway replenishment. So we have those already scheduled for food, but we can add other things on there. Or we also have a hebo debt on board that if we know where we can pre-position supplies to fly them out to the ship. You said there are over 800 people on board. Can you give us a breakdown how many doctors, how many nurses? Well, I have over 300 of our finest Navy corpsmen. And those the breakdown into specialists and techs. So we have lab techs, x-ray techs, pharmacy techs, physical therapy techs, and I have approximately 140 uh, medical type officers, so that's doctors, nurses, uh, MSC officers, which is not different than the MSC uh, line command that does the support medical service corps. So those include your pharmacists, your physical therapists. Um, you may have also, we have nurse practitioners and PAs, and I have a number of, uh, I have at least, uh, I have 45 doctors, and they don't count me anymore, unfortunately, on that list. But uh, I have, uh, and, they, and my executive officer is also in internal medicine. So we actually have two additional doctors that don't count on the list because we're in a position uh, that we're set for for CO and XO. Obviously, the mission that you do is 
critical, especially at a time like this? Do you anticipate any challenges that you can foresee now, maybe like a language barrier? Like, what are some of the challenges you are preparing for now? Well, I have a number of people on board a ship that speak Spanish, if we have that issue. You know, I've been doing this for a while, and I've had a lot of my mentors have always told me, if you get to do a humanitarian mission, it's usually the highlight of your career. And one of the joys is being a skipper in an Admiral, Admiral Swap, who's a Navman East Admiral, and the source, the source for most of our, almost all, actually all of our medical's capability, was on board last night and this morning. And walking around, and normally you get deployment, there's always people like, oh, I can't go for this reason or that reason. The energy, the smiles, the, the, the enthusiasm to help is really rewarding to see as a commanding officer. It's really heart, heart touching to, to see that. And I'm, I'm very proud of our sailors, and I couldn't be more proud. I mean, it's, it's almost like, put me in, coach. I can help. I'm ready to play. And they really have that enthusiasm. Just getting on board last night, you know, it just takes time to process that many people across that little brow, fighting and birthing, and not one person was complaining. Everyone's smiling and happy and just happy to be aboard. Uh, so it's, it's really an infectious uh, type thing. So I'm, they're really eager to help, and we'll do our best, whatever the Commodore has us do and uh, the higher authorities to do, we'll, we're standing by to assist. September 11th as well. Uh, September 11th. How does this particular crisis compare to September 11th? Um, well, each crisis is different. You know, September 11th had a focal point where it's gone. Uh, the natural disasters, and it's always a little more challenging working with the states because you also have to work with states. Uh, those different states, uh, uh, governments, and FEMA will actually will drive a lot of that, and a lot of the stuff's way above that. So we're just more of tell us what you want, and we'll support what you need. Many of the states, though, actually have inland, inland resources, so sometimes it's easier to move inland than to have to go out to sea. So depending on what kind of nation it is or na nature of the event, um, the, we have to, we're more in, tell us what you need and we'll support. And those 30 days begin once you make landfall in the you're not counting five days. Well, the supplies for 30 days is what we need to do with medical care. So when we start medical care, we, would, we, we knew we'll need food resupply. We have enough food for about 21 days for 900 people. You mentioned the morale and the energy was really high. Um, yeah. Are there any uh, challenges in terms of throwing all these people together at once and like procedures? Maybe someone does something differently than someone else and they kind of have to work things out? Or is that, no, is that we're. Really it goes, actually, it's amazingly, uh, the teamwork approach is really a, a pretty good. Most of we're all active duty. So we all worked in different, we were all plug and play, if you will. I've been in, deployed downrange to Iraq or, if, uh, or as an ERSS team lead to different areas. And the, the, there are general training pipelines that people have, so a lot of it is consistent. People always have their certain preferences, like I like this type of retractor if I'm a surgeon, and surgeons always have their own little personal things they like. But I'm an ER doc, so there's always a little battle between the ER doc and surgeons, so. How many people, um, medical staff, are on the ship? So there are se at least 71 mariners, we may have a little more plus up for that, that actually run the hull. And on the medical side, I have over 800 right now. Well, that includes my support staff. So not just medical, I have an, a large non-medical component. So somebody has to feed people. So we have a galley that can provide up to 8,500 meals a day if appropriately, if properly stored. We don't need that much right now because we only have 900 people on board times three. So at least 3,000 meals a day will be cooking. So I need staff to do that. And then we have logistics supply orders. So I have barns of warehouses on here I can put stuff in and a whole bunch of people, civilians and military that work together to make sure we have what we need. So it's over, right now over 800 military uh, staff and then the 71 civilian mariners. I'm sorry, you said this early, I do apologize. Is your ship equipped with dialysis? I remember yes. watching the report, a late center mom was without dialysis for days. So. Correct. So the ship has capability for dialysis. Like I said, it can provide them nearly anything any medical hospital, tertiary care facility in the States can provide, except MRI and usually some of the neurosurgical procedures. Uh, if you staff it right. So we, we are always have dialysis machines. We've actually plussed up from uh, Portsmouth with two other ones. And we've actually have nephrology on board and dialysis techs as support. So the beds, or you have to look at that, it's 250 beds is a breakdown because you have, of that, 50 beds are in the ICU. So those 250 beds are varying level of care. If I could ask everybody, obviously they have to go in away in 90 minutes, so we're going to go last question. Whoever can get it in. Uh, in terms of um, once you've been victims on board um, and they're let's say in an ICU unit, how, how does the handoff work? Where do you, where do they, do they end up back in Puerto Rico? Do you take them to the states? Does it, does it matter? Depends what the condition is, and 
there's also people that have come from other, other islands from the previous storms that are maybe there too. So if they're a foreign national, we would work with, their, with the embassy and state department to get them back to their host country. Puerto Rico actually is a U.S. territory, so a lot of it depends on do they have other assets or resources anywhere else, or is Puerto Rico ready to take